Hello, ECF, how you guys doing? If you're in the lobby, come on in, let's worship together. As Christians, we have rhythms that we follow. Uh, one of them that we're trying to discipline ourselves in is Sabbath. And so every seven days, we rest, we cease from doing things. And another rhythm that we're talking about today is we gather what we're doing here today to be encouraged, to be built up, to honor God collectively, and then we scatter throughout the week to be missional kingdom elements. And so uh, would you guys stand with us, and let's just have a moment of silence. Just remember that God is faithful. He has done amazing things throughout all of our lives. We could sit here and give testimony after testimony, um, but it's something about taking a deep breath. We're going to worship our God who does these things in and through us, and he, he draws near. So let's take a moment. God, we thank you that you are the one that pulls us together. You are who knit this body together. And so, Father, may we praise your son's name. May we praise who you are and the wonderful things that you've done. So let's sing together. our King. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Has done great things. Church, let's sing together. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. Have done great things. You've been faithful, faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. Your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things, yeah. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. We sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah. Done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, 
done super great things. And the beautiful thing is, is that he does those great things through us. So this song calls us to action. I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. I could hold on, I could hold on. I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home, never let these walls down. But you have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you Hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home, never let these walls down. But you have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go away.
sing that one more time as all the congregation. Father, you are set apart. You are unique. So God, we give you all our praise and ask that you'd receive it, that you'd mend and shape our hearts as your children today. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. This is the time we get to hang out, meet someone new. So turn to your neighbor, say hi. We'll be back in a second. Hello, hello. Good evening, friends. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I love this. I could actually just sit here and listen to them for a while, but we got things to do, friends. <laughs> hello, my name is Nicole. I'm the financial admin at ECF. Um, there are just a few announcements. Most of them you can find in your bulletin on the app and on the website. Um, typically once a month we have an elder come up and do some sharing with you. Um, I am not an elder, but I am in cahoots with one. So I'm going to give you a little share, <laughs> sharing with you and a little encouragement. So, um, 
just reflecting on um, the, ba- the past few months um, and weeks of the scriptures and sermons and discussions we've had in staff meeting and in community group, um, things that have resonated with me, I wanted to share those with you. Um, we can memorize or say all the right things, read all the right scriptures, do all of this, um, but without love, it falls on deaf ears or sounds like a crashing gong, just like last week, right? Um, and as I was pondering on all these things, um, and this time of year, which brings us all these fall love events and love campaigns we're giving of our time and talents, um, I just was pondering, and um, it's, in a, it's super simple and easy for, almost, for some of us to just kind of, for lack of a better word, throw money or fund something, right, without having action um, behind it and love behind it. Um, so what I treasured most and was blown away last week with the trunk or treat, you guys, I'm going to cry, but I'm not going to cry. <laughs> it was just really cool to see how you guys showed up, brought food, dressed up, decorated in the rain and in the wind, and um, were able to just serve the community, not just our community in these walls, but outside of these walls. And the smiles on the faces of the kids that came up and people that we've never met before, it was just it just blessed my heart. So um, as we continue this fall season with Thanksgiving baskets, Operation Christmas Child, New Horizon Ministry backpacks, and we dream about what next year brings us, let's be love and charity in action. Thanks, Kai and Tyler, for King James Version charity, right? In action, um, not just with our funds, but funds are definitely important, right? But with our hearts open, our minds in prayer, and our bodies in action as we engage the community and culture around us. So that's my little word of encouragement. Don't forget, next week, Sunday. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> I told her, in case I forget, she, she got me. Operation Christmas Child boxes are due tomorrow. Or tomorrow. Next week, Sunday. I was doing so well. So, um, so yeah, if you've missed anything that we are doing where can you find it all? App, website, bulletin, one of us, right? And thank you so much. I'll invite Joseph up. Let me start us off in a word of prayer this evening. Father, we, we thank you for this evening, we thank you for the gift of community, for the gift of the family of God, for our brothers and sisters who sit to our left and our right, for our brothers and sisters who are joining us online right now, and those who watch this in the days and the weeks to come. Father, I believe your heart's desire is that we would be a body of regular rhythms of coming together and gathering and then being sent out by the Holy Spirit across the entire Puget Sound every week as we scatter to our places of employment, as we scatter to our homes, to our communities, to the neighborhoods and cities where we live. And so I would ask this evening that as we look to your word as we look to the early church in the book of Acts and this routine and rhythm of gathering and scattering. May you guide us. May you help us to see the truth of your word. May you convict us where we need to be convicted. May you encourage us by the power of your spirit where we need to be encouraged so that we may live as you desire. We ask and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we have all heard the phrase, there's no I in team, right? But most people respond with something like, yeah, but there's an I in win. For those of us who have or have been sports fans in the past or who are currently, we are almost numb to the proclamation that it's all about the team from seven-figure per year athletes with multi-million dollar shoe contracts and private Lear jets. And yet, there exists this interesting dichotomy for someone like LeBron James or Tom Brady or 
Christian Ronaldo, if you don't know these names, they're famous athletes. You see, these athletes do want their teams to win. But the success of their teams have often been highly dependent on the individual ability to consistently perform at a high level. So was it, what is it about? From a success perspective, is it about the team or is it about the individual? Well, yes and yes. And so for us who are here today, for those who are joining online, I'd like to encourage us to ask the same question within the context of a local church. Is success from God's perspective about you as an individual Christian? Is success from God's perspective about this local body of believers as a local church? Or is success from God's perspective about the bigger global church and about his kingdom in general? Well, once again, yes and yes and yes. God's desire is for his kingdom, the, the, the big picture. And yet God accomplishes the purposes of his kingdom through the local church, through a family of believers that, like us who exist here today. And how does the local church accomplish its, person, its purposes? Through me, through Todd, through John, through Alex, through Sean, through Pam, through all of us as individuals living out the life that God has called us to. And so this is kind of the, the culmination Sunday of a six-week series that we did on engaging culture, starting with the foundation of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We followed that through the wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Then we've talked about things like becoming all things to all people, seeking the shalom, the well-being, the good of the city, being a body where love flows out and exists harmoniously in relationships between us. And this week, we reach the, the final Sunday where we're going to talk about gathering and scattering, the rhythm of the local church, which is the very means by which we do everything that we've discussed these past six weeks. And we're going to do this today by touching on the book of Acts. But I want to remind you of something first. Back in Matthew 16, Jesus said these well-known words, I will build my church. Jesus will build his church. And Acts is the story of Jesus fulfilling his promise to build the church. And so the book of Acts is a continuation of Luke's gospel account. And early on in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we read this. The words should be behind me on the screen here. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so already in the first few verses in the book of Acts, we begin to see the church by way of the disciples gathering and scattering in verse 6. So when they had come together, when they had gathered together, and then Jesus says, and I will send you out, I will scatter you. And friends, what's going on here is truly amazing. Jesus' great commission, go and make disciples of all nations, the means by which he established to build his church is being launched right here in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost arrived. The Holy Spirit showed up in a real and powerful way. And in Acts 2, 4, we read, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there's lots of different perspectives on this, but one of maybe the most common perspectives here is that actually what's happening here 
is Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is giving language to the early disciples so that as they go out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, they're equipped to go and make disciples so that Jesus will fulfill his promise in building his church. After this, Peter preaches a phenomenal sermon, reminding the people of their sin, painting a picture of the church as a family of forgiven sinners who are saved by grace through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And then we come to the primary passage for this evening's sermon, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. So could we stand together, and as we've done these last few weeks, we're going to listen Uh, to this week's passage read by one of our youth. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray once more. Father, we come before you this evening. May your spirit speak to us through the power of of your scripture, through the power of your word. We ask and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So what's the first thing we see in this initial gathering of believers? The first thing we see in this week's passage are these words, and they were devoted. And they were devoted. And so as we jump into this gather and scatter conversation, let's jump in acknowledging that the early church was full of devoted people, devoted individuals. But devoted to what? Devoted to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we see here in Acts chapter 2, devoted to the body of believers, to the community of followers of Christ. And look, I know that in this time that we find ourselves, it's not popular and there's this temptation to take a pastor calling people to devotion to the church is like insensitive or something like that. But I want to point out two things here about devotion. These these people were devoted to the church, to being in person together because of the gospel, because of their deep love for Jesus, because of what they believed Jesus desired, they gathered regularly and frequently together. But it's also not just about gathering, as they say, to put rear ends in the chairs. It's about gathering because you need me and I need you. And if you look to your right, the person to your right needs you. And if you look to your left, the person to your left needs you. You have gifts, you have abilities that God has breathed into you for the purpose of his kingdom, but that those gifts are often expressed in the context of a local body. And so friends, I know that as I stand here this evening, I'm preaching to the choir. And yet I want to remind us that this is what we see at the very start of the early church. Devotion. Devotion. And, and you know, we, we live in a culture where it's like, oh man, do I, I mean, have to go today? There's a Seahawk game on, or it's really cold outside, and it's, you know, all of these questions go through our mind. All of these questions of, can I do church alone? Can I grow and thrive? I don't, I don't need the church. I just need the word and Jesus. And, and I get all of those arguments, but friends, here's what we see like really quickly after Jesus died, the disciples who walked with him, 
they de were devoted to the church. They were devoted to the community of believers because they trusted that that's what Jesus desired. And, and, and then we see four really specific things that they were devoted to here in verse 42. They were devoted to teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking of bread. And they were devoted to prayers. And, and so these are four things that as we gather corporately here on Sundays, as you gather in smaller groups, in community groups, or as you gather for Bible studies, as you gather for breakfast, as you gather in your homes, these are four parts of our weekly gathering that, that kind of define who we are, teaching. This is the most important thing that we have been given, <laughs> God's word, and so we spend time every week around his word, here corporately, through reading scripture out loud, through the teaching of the word, in community groups, as you come together and talk about a sermon or you talk about another study, we, we gather around for the sake, in part, of teaching. We gather for fellowship. We see this in Acts chapter 2, they came together for fellowship, again, we need one another. If there's anything that we've learned from the last few years of a global pandemic, it's that we don't thrive when we're alone. We don't thrive in isolation. We don't thrive when we're stuck in our homes. We don't thrive when we can't come together face to face. Has technology helped? Absolutely. Absolutely. Technology is a great thing. Technology can never fully replace being face-to-face -face in the presence of one another. And so we gather for fellowship. We see the early church gathering for the breaking of bread. It, most scholars believe in this case that they're talking about communion because just a few verses down, they talk about gathering in one another's homes to share a meal together. But, but it could be either way. But, but I think here we gather specifically to take communion, which is why we do this every single week. Friends, I need this every week. It, it's not that if we don't, if we miss a week that we've somehow been disobedient or we've somehow, but I need, and I think we all need a reminder every week to say, who am I at my core? Who's the son of God? What must have happened for me to be in relationship with God? And what does that mean for my life? And so we come together for the breaking of bread. And we come together for prayers. Times in corporate prayer together, times of silence in our community groups. I hope that we're praying for one another, that we're being open and honest and transparent with our, our struggles and the things that are going on in our lives, that we're laying hands on one another and praying. But these are the things in the early church, really the first group of believers that we see as part of their gathering, teaching, fellowship, communion, prayers. And then we read in verse 43, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Friends, the, the early church was a supernatural community. Because without the awe and wonders and signs, without the things that the apostles were doing through the power of the Holy Spirit, they were just people getting together. And, and getting together is a good thing. Getting together under the power of the Holy Spirit is a much better thing. And I know that we live in a world where the spectrum on how the Spirit works and how that plays out in our life and what that looks like is very wide. But unfortunately, we live in the world where the far charismatic perspective has made some of us respond when we talk about the Holy Spirit of like, that's weird, I don't understand it, I don't like it, it makes me feel uncomfortable, so I don't want to go there. But here's what we see when the early church gathered 
and awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And friends, so when we gather together, we gather together under God in the power and in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit because we're part of something supernatural. Without God, without the Holy Spirit, we're kind of wasting our time here. But with God and under the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, our gatherings breathe life into the world around us. Our gatherings give us what we need to then go out for the next six days and scatter across the city. The Holy Spirit empowers us to remember the words of Christ, to, to think back on the power of the gospel, to be empowered to go out and share with one another as, as part of of a supernatural community that's guided by the Holy Spirit. Then we see in verses 44 and 45 this sacrificial nature of the early church where people are selling their possessions and giving to those who have a need. And in 46 and 47, we read, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so we see here at the end of Acts, we're starting to see what Jesus instructed the disciples, what I read here at the beginning in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. They come together and Jesus says, and you will go out in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And we're starting to see the very beginning of this in these verses tonight. That they gathered together for teaching and prayer and communion and fellowship. And then day by day, they're being sent out. And they're gathering still as they're scattered. Breaking bread in their homes receiving food, praising God, having favor with all people. And we don't know in this verse exactly what's happening, but here's what we do know. We're told that the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what we know is that these disciples, early followers of Jesus, scattered throughout Jerusalem, throughout the city, and in addition to gathering in homes and enjoying meals together, they're telling people about Jesus. They're serving people. They're doing things that make other people say, I want that. <laughs> why, why are you motivated to love in this way? Why are, are you motivated to serve in this way? I look, at, I look at this early group of Jesus followers, and I see Jew and Greek, and I see you know, this race and this ethnicity, and it's weird because you're all gathering together in harmony and in unity. You're all being scattered out with the same purpose, with the same mind. I want, I want in on that. And so we see here in Acts chapter 1 and 2, this, this early rhythm, I've heard several pastors say it's a rhythm like inhaling and exhaling. We can't just inhale all the time without exhaling. We can't just exhale all the time without inhaling. It, it's a normal rhythm of inhale, exhale. And so is the rhythm of the local church. Gather, scatter. Gather, scatter. Like breathing. And this goes on throughout the entire book of Acts. In Acts, chapters 4 through 10, it's all about the growth of the first churches. And friends, this was not linear growth without conflict. This was growth that came from intense persecution, commitment to ministry, build, pressure building on both the inside and the outside, yet a never-ending sight on the work of Jesus Christ. can be easy for us, the local church today, as we gather and scatter to, to feel pressure from society, court, culture, politics, etc., and, and to feel like that's a bad thing. But, but in Acts chapters 4 through 10, we see intense pressure and intense growth. And friends, we see the same thing around the world today. The church is growing fastest, 
generally speaking, in the areas with the most persecution, Iran, China. I mean, the church is exploding in some of these regions where there's intense persecution. So, so I'm not saying we should love persecution as we gather and scatter, but we shouldn't maybe spend so much time trying to fight the persecution and instead follow what the Lord has called us to do in the midst of persecution. Then we get to chapter 11. We're told about the church at Antioch. And we're told that it was a result of, quote, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen in Acts eleven nineteen. A result of what? Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. And so because of persecution in Jerusalem, the disciples and the followers of Jesus scattered around the region. And that's where the church took root in Antioch. Word got back to the church in Jerusalem, and the apostles sent Barnabas, one of their best, to start the church in Antioch. And people were being saved in great numbers. And in verse 26, we read, And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Antioch was the place where the term Christian, Christ follower, or like Christ, or image of Christ, there's a lot of different ways we can think about translating that. That's when it started being used. Because of the persecution and the scattering. People in Antioch were like, these little Christ followers, they're Christians. In chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas were sent to plant churches from Antioch. And in the rest of Acts, we read about their journeys. Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, Colossae. The list goes on. And throughout the rest of Acts, the early Christians established the rhythm that the church must emulate today. Gather, scatter, gather, scatter, gather, scatter. We come together to sit under the word. We come together for fellowship. We come together for prayer. We come together to break bread together. And then after that, we are sent out and scattered to all of the different places. In our homes, the gathered in temples, throughout the city, to other cities, to those who have not yet heard. And friends, this is what we're called to do. This is what we're called to do as a local body of believers. I've said this once or twice throughout this series, but this church body, this local church that we call Eastside Christian Fellowship, is already scattered throughout the Puget Sound region. And the temptation is to think of that as a bad thing. The temptation is to look only at the challenges of that. The challenge of getting together, the challenge of traffic, the challenge of can we do anything on a weeknight because nobody, or because it's hard to come together because of all the traffic and all of these kinds of things. And so the temptation is to look at the reality that we are from Renton to Snohomish, that we are from Seattle further east. I don't know about the furthest family east, maybe me. But, but, but really, we are a really big region, and here's the good news. That's perfect. Does it create challenges? Yes, but does it help in the rhythms of inhale, exhale, come together, scatter out, gather? Yes, it really does. And so in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your communities, in your places of work, we're not just going out and living. We're not just going out and earning a paycheck. We're not just going out and taking care of our kids. We're not just going out and existing as a member of a neighborhood or a community. We are being sent out. We are being scattered across the Puget Sound on purpose with a mission from Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we need these rhythms. We need the rhythm of coming together. I need the rhythm of coming together. I don't think I'm the only one. 
who needs to see people, who needs to be encouraged, who needs to know I'm not the only one who had a terrible week, who needs to rub shoulders with a brother and sister, who needs to be encouraged by worship and prayer and in communion. We need to do that. Why? Because we need to inhale in order to exhale. We need to be fed in community as we gather in order to scatter and do the work that God has called us to. And so I want to ask some questions this evening. And these questions are meant to get us pondering and thinking. And in five or ten minutes, I'm going to invite James Kirk to come up. He's the collaborator for this week, and he's going to help us think through and process through some of this gathering and scattering. But, but here are some questions I want to ask, and I'm going to ask and just leave a pause for a minute. The first question, where might God be opening doors for you to share the love of Jesus with another person? Workplace, neighborhood, community, family, friends? Where might God be opening doors for you to share the love of Jesus with another person? Number two, where is God sending you to serve others? There's an intentional difference here. The first question about sharing the love of Jesus. The second question, where is God sending you to serve others? I'll tell you what, since meeting with some of the leaders at John Muir Elementary and Kamiakin Middle School and going through training to be a Lake Washington School District volunteer, they are desperate, desperate for people to come in and have lunch with kids who are struggling to make relationships. They're desperate for people to come in and volunteer in various ways. I would love to put you in touch with the volunteer coordinator for Lake Washington School District, but there's so many other opportunities. How can you serve your neighbors? How can you serve in your place of work? What, commu what neighborhood communities or organizations exist around you that are serving other people? Where is God sending you? Okay, Not where are you going dragging your feet, but where is God sending you to serve others? Number three, do you need to prioritize or reprioritize gathering with other followers of Christ. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's easy, it's really easy to get out of the habit of gathering together. Corporately, on Sundays like this, in community groups, with one other believer for coffee or prayer early in the morning before you go to work. So do you need to prioritize or reprioritize gathering with other followers of Christ? Trust me, we need this. It's what God designed. Number four, in what spaces have you lacked intentionality and need the Holy Spirit's power, wisdom, and strength? In what spaces have you lacked intentionality? In other words, as you are being sent and scattered throughout the Puget Sound, what areas of your life are you just coasting? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just putting one foot in front of the other? Are you just checking the boxes on your to-do list? Not that those are bad things. We all have boxes to check. We all have motions to go through. We all have work to get done. But are you being intentional in those areas? Where might you need to ask the Holy Spirit for his power, wisdom, and strength? Number five, is it possible that you need to change your mindset regarding those closest to you? Okay, this is a hard one because oftentimes when we think about scattering, we think of those people. But family is messy. Friendships are messy. Neighbors can be messy. <laughs> and so in what areas, or is it possible that you might need to change your mindset with those closest to you? Maybe God is scattering those, scattering you, like to your closest relationship. That's where he's calling you to do ministry right now. That's where he's sending you to right now. It's possible that some of us might need to change our mindset there. Number six, 
Would an accountability partner help support your aspirations regarding gathering and scattering? Okay, look, I know accountability partner is like a really, really churchy word. I just couldn't think of a better word. Do you need a friend? I mean, some of the times of my life where I've had the most significant growth has been times where I've had someone bothering me because I asked them to bother me. In a loving, kind, gentle way, wanting what is best for me, but I've gone to them and said, look, I want to be better at X, and I've tried by myself, and I can't do it. I've tried, and I just keep saying week after week, I want to be better at this, and then the week passes, and I'm still just as terrible. And so it's possible that you might need support and help through a friend, through a wife or husband, through a neighbor, through a brother or sister who's sitting around here today. You might need someone to just say, come on, to keep you accountable. And lastly, question seven, do you regularly pray before being scattered by the Lord so that you may do his will? Man, I was really convicted by this question. I almost thought about just leaving it off so I didn't have to think about it anymore. (laughs) But I mean, think about it. As we wake up and do X for the day, whatever that may be, go to work, stay at home with the kids, engage with your neighbors, volunteer, go to the golf course and play golf with the men's club, go on vacation, whatever that might be, Do you regularly pray before God scatters you? Lord, I need your help today in this thing. I want to be sent by you today. I don't want to just go about my business. My hope in asking these questions is that our minds begin to rattle with the different aspects of gathering and scattering. And so, James, would you come up here? James is the collaborator for this week. James and I meet somewhat regularly, and I've gotten to hear some encouraging stories about some of the aspects and ways that you think about being part of this body here as we gather weekly, as you've been engaged in various community groups over the years, and as you go and scatter to your family, but also as a bus driver in the Bellevue Bellevue School District. And so can you share with us just kind of a few of your thoughts that have come to your mind on this idea of just coming together and gathering and then scattering throughout the week as God calls you to? First, I'd like to acknowledge that the struggle is real. Sometimes daily, sometimes hourly. I think of the lyrics of the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Mm. But I've noticed that, and and I was reminded of this uh, at a gathering yesterday, laugh and lunch, a lunch and laugh, um, that God has been using our struggles our whole life, getting us ready for what he wants us to do from day to day. Got to give credit to the uh, comedian Michael Jr. who who brought that message. It was um, a great gathering, and I gleaned something from it. If I hadn't gathered with the group that did the the cleanup and 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 that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked that up. Um, so God has been using my life in ways that I wouldn't have. Imagined I got a degree in youth ministry at Northwest College back when that's what it was called. And now I'm a bus driver. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Um, But another thing that that Michael Jr. said is that everybody is good at something. Mm. Everybody. And when you live your life through all the struggles and all that, um, God wants to use you where you're good. And I'm really good with compassion. Um, Whenever you take one of those surveys, I always score really high on personality traits of of wanting to help. But it means being ready. So I have a story. I have a neighbor who's a believer, and she had been going to the Panera close to where we live 
three nights a week and taking all the stuff that's left at the end of the day that they're just going to throw away. And she's been sp uh, taking it to different groups in, in her sphere of influence. And every now and then, um, she would open up her trunk in our neighborhood, and our neighbors would come and get whatever we could get. And um, I would regularly check out what she had. And she decided um, right before the start of school this year that she was going to scale back, and she was getting tired. So she was going to go from three nights to one night. So I decided, I wonder if they'd let me take one of her nights. And so I started taking Panera Bread on Thursday nights um, to work, and um, people notice. My coworkers look forward to Fridays now <laughs> because they know they're getting some treats. And um, so people notice, and, and my coworkers, for the most part, know that I'm a Christian and that I do things a little bit different. Um, one guy said, uh, "This is silly." Um, he said, "You know, I know you're a Christian, so you know how Jesus fed the five thousand with bread and fish. That's you." <laughs> and I thought, no, that's not me. <laughs> but in some way, I take what he said with there's some truth to it. I've decided to. It's a little bit inconvenient to go and you know bedtime. On Thursday nights and go get bread, but um, but it matters to people. And at the men's retreat, we had a a speaker from New Horizons, mm -hmm. and he talked about the struggle of interacting with um, the teens there. That they don't really think of the church as a relevant institution, but I think our actions of love. get out there and scatter and do things. It's just a matter of paying attention. Yeah. Band, why don't you make your way back up here? And as they're doing that, James, um, you've shared a little bit with me that this school year, you've gone from bus driver to stepping in as um, the representative from the workers union and the school uh, and the school bus system. And I know you're intentional with what that means for you, but you're also working in a place where there are rules and regulations and sharing the gospel in just a really direct way during work hours is not encouraged. And But I know you've also worked really hard at what it means to represent this group. Could you just share a word or two about kind of looking at that part of your role as scattering and being sent out? Um. Yeah, I've been a shop steward there for, for quite some time, and I, we just finished our, my second experience in negotiating a contract. And your peers have to vote you into these positions. And um, I had somebody come up to me after we reported on how we negotiated our, our latest contract. He said, you know, all those people that didn't think you'd do a good job because you wouldn't put up a fight and all this, and he said, boy, I'm glad we decided to vote you in because I am willing to put up a fight for, for the right things. Mm. As a shop steward, I have drivers coming to me all the time feeling like they're not being treated right. And I have to earn their trust, but I also have to work with management. I can't be against management because they're the ones that I have to report to and work with when things don't go right. So it is a messy group. It's not, it's not um, I guess maybe it's, it's because God's been getting me ready mm. all my life with, you know, growing up in a broken home and having to be a diplomat between my parents. And so these skills have been developing all my life, and now God's using them. And I'm, I guess I just want to encourage everybody to, to pay attention because God will use you too. And so, friends, as we go out in the week, it's so easy to think, I'm a bus driver. I mean, I'm driving buses full of kids. I'm transporting them from here to there. And if I do that safely, I've done my job. And yet, 
the rhythms that we see in the church of gathering and scattering are not just you're a bus driver. It's you're being sent to the school district as a driver to do the work that God has called you to. So that's my encouragement for us this week. I'm going to ask us to stand together. We're going to sing I Speak Jesus, which has kind of become a little bit of an anthem for us this last um, you know, few weeks. And then I'm going to come up and lead us in communion. And then we're going to conclude with um, one song. So, Dan, go ahead and lead us. Something beautiful that we get to be Jesus to people. I just want to speak the name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there's a peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus To every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear. Jesus from the mountains, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name
peace within your presence. I speak, Jesus. our eyes closed and our hearts and our minds still focused on this design that God has of gathering and scattering, I want to encourage us just for a moment to acknowledge and recognize the natural chasm, the natural separation that our sin causes between us and God. I want to encourage us to, for just a moment to sit in this space that, that says, without something, I'm lost. Without something, I'm broken without something. I'm, I'm stuck in my own ways. I'm stuck in my own sin. And God's word tells us that no matter how hard we try, we won't ever quite get there. No matter how many good things we do, no matter how many people we encourage, no matter how much time we spend with our hearts and our minds in the right place, we still fall short. And yet the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so part of gathering together may be one of the most of the most important parts of gathering together is to be reminded of that truth. And so it's with that in mind that we come to the table, so to speak. So let's take the bread in our hands together as a community that has gathered And Lord, we hold the piece of bread in our hands, which represents the body of Christ, broken for us. And we don't do this lightly out of habit, but we do this with intention and purpose to remind ourselves to relish in the reality of Christ's body. So, Father, we thank you for sending your one and only Son, whose body was broken for us. And as we take this bread, we remember what was done for us. We take Jesus in through the power of the Spirit in a way that profoundly changes us and impacts us. Let's take the bread. And as we hold the cup in our hands, which represents Christ's blood, we acknowledge once again our sin and the necessity of a mediator to come between us and God to draw us back into relationship with the Father. And so we hold the juice which represents the blood of Christ poured out for us. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus so that through his death, we may be brought into relationship with you. Let's take the cup.
we're going to sing one more song together. And as we sing the first verse and chorus, I would like to encourage us just to sit and listen for a moment. It's a song that's probably new to most of the people in this room. You can be seated. You can be standing. I would encourage us to be in a posture that, that just says, Jesus, I'm, I'm here before you. And then after the first verse and chorus, Zach is going to ask us to sing this together. But I want to read the words because I, I want them to, to be meaningful, to be powerful. The song is called Driven by Love. The first verse says, to know you and to make you known. This is the anthem of our souls. Send us out. We will go anywhere you lead us, Lord. And the chorus, driven by love till all have heard, will carry your name to the ends of the earth. We'll carry your love and shine with your light till the whole world knows you and lifts you high. In the second verse, our eyes we set on Jesus as we obey the great commission. As the Father sent his only son, Jesus, you are sending us. Oh, Jesus, you are sending us. And so I want to remind us, we don't just walk out this evening. We're sent out this evening. We don't just go to our places of work, we're sent into our places of work. We don't just live in communities, we are sent to our communities. And so let's take in these words and then Zach will invite us to stand and sing with him. To know you and to make you know this is the anthem of our soul. Send us out and we will go. the song goes. If you'd like to join us, sing along. To know you and to make you know. This is the anthem of our soul. Send us out and we will go. Broken world around 
around us. Let us be a heart of God to the unreached and forgotten. Let's be a healing arm. There's a task you lay before us. Your voice we can't ignore. You said go into the nation as your final word. about this last six weeks, here's the one thing that I I just want us all to get around, and it's this. You're not here on accident. I don't only mean like sitting in the chair tonight, although I also believe that is true. But, but living in this place and this time with all of the challenges that face the church, God has purpose and a plan and a design, and it includes you. I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's incredible to wake up and say, today God has purpose for me. And again, the purpose is not about just more people and more people so that we can check off boxes. The purpose is... Without Jesus, people are condemned to eternal separation from God. And with faith in Jesus, they will live in eternity with their creator. What better thing can we do for this world than to become all things to all people, to seek the shalom of the city, to love one another, to gather and scatter, to be founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit so that we can win some, so that some may come to know Christ. That's all of our call. So I'm going to close us with prayer, and then um, pretty much immediately we have a 20, 25-minute kind of closing Q&A about next chapter, about some of the videos we've been releasing about where we're going as a church. If you have kids in kids ministry, our volunteers are expecting to be back there until about 6.50. So we've got about 26 minutes from now where kids are taken care of. But if you need to go or you need to go and collect a little one and bring them back and sit on your lap, I'm okay with noise. I'm okay. I've got four kids of my own. Crying is fine conversation is fine, you know, praying in tongues for the two-year-old is fine with me as they sit here. All of that is totally fine. So we're going to pretty much transition right into this, acknowledging that some people have somewhere to go or to go out. Dave and Sam are going to join me um, on stage. John is going to be kind of the mic runner. And what we want to do is just say what questions have come up as you've watched videos, as, as you've learned a little bit about this vision renewal and where we're going what questions. And then at about 6.50, because we have some really loving volunteers who are going to be pretty tired by then with the kids, I'm going to dismiss us, but the elders are happy to stay here if there's conversations or questions that are going to take us past that time. So let me pray for us. Father, uh, what a beautiful thing it is to come together. What a beautiful thing it is to acknowledge the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful thing it is to do that together in community. So I thank you this evening for bringing together this diverse group of people here in person, online, scattered throughout the Puget Sound region. 
And Father, our desire is to make you known. So this week and in the weeks and in the months and the years to come, would you help us stand on the power of the gospel? Would you help us to be empowered by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit? Would you help us to understand each week what it means to be all things to all people? Would you show us opportunities where we can seek the shalom, the well-being, the welfare of this city that you have called us to? Would you help us to look to our left and our right and see our brother and sister with love that is patient and kind and not envious and not boastful? And would you help us to desire the rhythms by which you have created Christian community to gather, to scatter, to gather, and to scatter? And in all of this, Father, may we not seek our own glory. May we not seek our own name, our own notoriety, our own fame, but may we always seek your glory, your honor. May your name be glorified. So empower us as we go. We ask and we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you need to go, feel free to do that. John is going to grab a mic, Dave and Sam. Um, I think you're going to use these two mics here. Um, and we're just going to open up a time of questions regarding any of the, the shifts or the changes that you have um, listened to over these last five weeks. And I'm going to say one quick thing. If one question feels like it's turning into a really long conversation, uh, I might gently and very respectfully say, why don't we grab coffee or lunch? Or Because some questions might lead to, to longer conversations. And the, the hope tonight is to give as many people a, a chance to kind of jump in with a question. Dave and Sam, anything you guys want to say before? No, good. We value your questions. We're all, we're all in this together, right? So. You are what I call the committed core. So we're very interested in your co-participation. Questions are good. So go ahead and raise a hand if after watching a video or reading something or hearing something, if there's something that is percolating in your mind, go ahead and, and raise your hand and shout it out. And if nobody has questions, you're making our job really easy. Kai, Uh, I can go ahead and break the ice, I guess. Um, in regards to the recent, most recent video on church leadership, uh, and there was talk about distribution of kind of responsibilities or roles, having these leadership teams. Uh, is there any, uh, see if I can pick one question. Um, what is the expectation, if there is any right now, of what the formation of those leadership teams might look like and part of where I asked that question from is the context of we have a pretty rigorous process for like electing our eldership. So I'm curious, will that process look any similar? Will it look different? And if so, in what ways? Yeah, I can take a quick answer to that. And then if you guys want to jump in, um, the eldership has not gotten as far as saying like these would be uh, I'm going to use the word qualifications just because I think we know what I mean. These would be the qualifications and someone has to pass this sort of test. Kind of the, the, the length that we've gotten is in this last few years, the elders have been pulled in a lot of different directions in, in our heart's desires for the elders to shepherd this church to the best of their ability. And as we move into the next season, there's... Um, a lot of peripheral needs that if the elders jump in on, then the shepherding is going to suffer. And so um, we've talked about bringing together those teams. The process at which that's going to happen um, has not been defined, but I will say that there is a, a, a heart to ensure that those teams are being led by individuals who have walked with Jesus for a season, who have been committed to ECF for a season, 
and, and I think as we move closer to that, those conversations will happen, but there's no definition yet. But I, I think that, that part of that is coming out of the idea that perhaps there's some um, some division of, of talents and things on the eldership that then, you know, one or two, a couple of elders can then go and take and take a responsibility for that. You know, our bylaws call for the shepherding of the church to be upon the elders. Uh, but the bylaws also say that, that they can delegate out a lot of the administrative things for the church. And I think what sometimes we find is an eldership gets tied up in administrative things. And um, I think it was real, a realization to us during the building, the acquisition of the building and everything. Some of us were really involved with the acquisition of the building. And yet we were able to pull in other people that had experience in that for a season. And it was just really rich to be able to do that and to pull in those talents. So this may just be seasonal things as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Acts, they saw a need to, to feed the widows and things. And so to pull, the, you know, pull together a group of people to do that. But I think part of that is that they would, at least for some of them, be elder-led groups, mm -hmm. which then gives a chance for the elders to be able to shepherd a smaller group of people too and, and kind of lead them some of the ideas we've run yeah. through. Yeah, I think one last thing to hope is that those groups would be filled with people who are passionate and gifted in the area that right. they're leading. So not like a eeny, meeny, miny, mo kind of thing, but but who has... Whoever's willing. Yeah, that's right, if you're breathing. <laughs> if you're breathing, yes. you're in. Yeah. You know, yeah, elders are people too, so we have different kinds of personalities, right? Some of us like to get more strategic and philosophical and take time to really kind of discuss and kick ideas around and others are we want to work give us something to do we don't like just sitting around namby pamby talking we want to you know stuff let's make a decision let's go do something right so we, we have to I think we have to balance that too you know as we've learned over the last few years who who's kind of gifted or called or I don't know inclined towards certain roles or uh, ways of working want to align with that too clear as mud right we're still figuring some of it out that helps is that helpful okay yeah. other questions i could just put a microphone in front of you all those videos and no questions were spurned in your head I know one of the things that you were talking about was a possibility of a name change. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if anybody could talk about the, the thinking behind that, why that would be good. Yeah, so the two motivations for having that conversation, so a decision has not been made. The two motivations for having that um, conversation are based on statistics and research about church attendance, but more specifically than that, um, non-Christians desire to participate with a specific church. And while it can be a touchy subject, we have two words in the name of the church that, that feel confusing. Um, so if you talk to people about fellowship, Christians know what that means. Outside, they're thinking, Medical Fellowship, Lord of the Rings, you know, what, and, and so choosing a name that, um, if anything, breaks down a barrier for people to say, I want to try out this community and see what it's like. And the second reason is if the Lord were to bless this church in terms of growth numerically, um, my heart and passion and the heart and passion of the elders would not be to get to a point where we have hundreds and thousands of people where we lose a lot of what makes ECF ECF in terms of community and fellowship and knowing people and those kinds of things. And so if the Lord were to bless this church and we were to grow, the long-term desire would be to plant. And there's a lot of different ways to do that which don't need to be part of this conversation, but Eastside Christian Fellowship doesn't plant from a regional perspective in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, Eastside Christian Fellowship Kirkland, Eastside Christian Fellowship 
I'm just throwing names out there, Snohomish, Eastside Christian Fellowship, Marysville, but a one or two word Kirkland, one word Snohomish, one word, it, it plants well and makes more sense. So those are, are two of the main motivations in terms of the process. We're right at the front end of bringing a team together to discuss possibilities. That team would take a list of potential recommendations to the elders, which the elders would then reflect on and determine if they want to move forward or not. So ultimately, this is an elder decision, but we've put a team together to help provide some thoughts and recommendations on whether we even want to take the next step or not. Does that help, Val? It, it does help. I just, uh, I don't know, maybe my, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how somebody on the outside would think that, gee, what happened there that they need to change their name? You know, I mean, what would be the, the downside of a, of a name change? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think if we were uh, larger in number and, and maybe influence, especially at this time of the season we're in right now, I think that might be a little bit more of a, a situation. I think that one of the things we're looking at is, is this the right opportunity? One of the questions that keeps being asked, is this the right opportunity? Is this too much to to break off now. I mean, we're a new facility and then a new name. Well, just from economically, when you start talking about a sign that could literally cost ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, you've got to really think through which, which name you want to put up there. Do you want to change an hour and a year and spend another? I mean, there's some practical uh, things about that. And, and I'll be first with you. I mean, uh, we've, Joseph and I had a lot of conversations. We're having conversations this week about this. So if there's anyone that's probably got uh, a right to have a little bit of a of a heartache, we start talking about this. It's, <laughs> it might be me. <laughs> I happen to be one of the ones who kind of initially thought of this. And I, but I also will say this: Look, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I've always said, and I'm consistently said, it's not the name; it's the people behind the name. It's the Jesus behind the name. It's not the name. You know, we are, we are known as a people who love. Hopefully. And that's what will ring through at the end of the day, whatever it takes to win more. And if, and if, if, if where we are in our world right now that, that it's going to reach more people or they think it's, you know, less offensive with a, another name or whatever, I'm good with that, whatever it takes. One of the other things I thought about was the, we just bought a building in the name of Eastside Christian Fellowship, right? So right. all of that. Well, that's an that entity works. name, right? So Eastside Christian Fellowship, Inc. is our Washington State uh, nonprofit. Companies all the mm -hmm. time have names. In fact, I'm kind of in the mergers and acquisitions business, and one of the things we always ask is, that's your company name, not what's your entity name? And more times than not, the entity is a wholly different name um, than what the name is. So what you do is there's a thing called a DBA or doing business as, and you just, it's an assumed name. So you, you basically register, it's like $10 to register the new name. And then we don't have to, or we go through and we can actually change the name of our entity, which is just a formality uh, online. So that, that's actually been part of the process this past week is what would, what would that look like from a, a Washington State standpoint? Good question, though, because you don't want to get where you're, that we can still have that as the official name. Can I, can I just respond briefly on the name thing as well? I, I don't know if there's another question coming about the same, but just some context, because I'm, I, you know, when this clown came up with the idea, maybe we need to think about the name, right? I was like... This clown. Yeah. yeah. Not, not this clown. This clown. It was like, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? We got a perfectly, These clowns. Good, <laughs> perfectly good name, you know? And um, But the more we talk about it as an eldership, and I think you guys see this too, is, you know, God is seeing fit through the open doors that he's, he's created to drop us into a new community, right? And you think about, you know, that building behind Olive Garden, right, that... There's, there's neighborhoods to, you know, to the north and west. There's new, like, they're going up, right, in buildings, right? I think senior communities are mm -hmm. in there. And we have this amazing opportunity to reach out and be a, you know, be a presence in those communities and, and deliver value, deliver Jesus and his message into those communities. So like Dave says, I think, we can't really hold on too much to anything but the essentials, right? And, and if it means um, 
changing that to, to better serve the mission that we see God leading us towards, then let's, let's talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. One more real practical I'm thing just I was about thinking about. Is thing, you know, there's tribal language, right? There's tribal language in churches. There's tribal language in your families. You, there's certain things you say that only your, fam only your tribe knows. Well, let me tell you what. How many of you, I have pastors I've dealt with for years. Some of my best friends, they go, East Side Christian, East Side Community Fellow. What's the name? Because we only know ECF. And, and we use ECF like everyone knows who ECF is. Now, how does that even begin to define us? I mean, just real practically speaking, for a, a person coming through the door who doesn't know the Lord or know you, and all of a sudden we're talking about ECF, and they're going, all I know is that they're talking about this thing called ECF, and I don't know what it means. And that's how tribal language, and how does that then translate if we ever want to go plant somewhere? So there's this practicality of what our, what our name is, but it's practicality of what we've been called and what we call ourselves for all these years, too. Um, I know that there are some other larger churches in the area that have recently changed it. Well, maybe not very recently, but have changed their names. And I know you said that you're in the very beginning process of this, but has anybody reached out to Rose Hill to see how that worked out for them? Or out to, like, the Baptist church that changed their name to Eastside Community? Is that something that's been done? I have or not something in the process? Yeah, I have not had those conversations. I mean, that's a great a great idea to talk to someone else in the area who's done that in the last five or ten years to get insight. Yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you for that. Good, good call. The new guy back there. So be, being the new guy, I, I have gone through something like that. The church I came from was Cross Point Baptist Church, and so we dropped Baptist Church, and all of a sudden we had all these people come in and and it's like, oh, yeah, they did, well, they didn't ask why we dropped. They came because uh, when we told them we, we were like a Estill Southern Baptist Convention Church, they were like, mm, I don't know if I would have came if I knew that. Um, and then we're like, but we're not weird. I'm like, what do you see that's like different? Um, and like, well, and so it, it got rid of a barrier. Um, and so it's same thing. I'm just re yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ana anecdote. Questions, guys? Raise your hand. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of rebranding re the home group, community group, small group? Yeah, th the when we decided to kind of launch into a vision renewal process, one of the most significant motivating factors was getting back to some of the roots that have been such a rich part of ECF's history, coat and blanket drive, and all the work that was done in the schools and local ministry partners and all of that, um, that after this long season of COVID and all the other stuff, we want to kind of um, renew that part of who we've been. And, and we made an intentional decision to say, since we're doing that, we're going to look at who we are and everything we do through that lens. And so um, the the primary motivating factors to shift, to encourage the shift from a more study model of a community group to a more service model, at least some of the time, is to do that, to kind of fall in suit with, with this renewed focus. The other aspect of that is when we land in the building and when we probably next fall is the hope, um, we talked about a, a weekly gathering done in six to eight week segments with a break where we're offering a Bible 101 class or a cooking class or a it, kind of a, a model of church combined with community center where we're inviting people in. And it feels like a lot to say, as a church, we're encouraging Sunday gathering, a weekly evening, and an every week community group. And so the thinking is, community groups can be more service oriented, which allows us to invite our friends who aren't Christians who probably won't say yes to coming and sitting down and studying the Bible for an hour and a half, but probably would say yes, or at least are more likely to say yes to, do you want to come and help rebuild a fence at a, one of my neighbors who's a widow and, and can't do it herself? And to do that a little bit less frequently so that we can really focus on our 
gathering times on Sundays and our weekly um, times once we get into the new building and have a few months under our belt and feel like we've, we're getting some traction on it. Yeah, if any of you watch TikTok, you'll know that there's a whole generation of people out there that need to an education on how to put out a, a fire if it starts in your can in your kitchen. What? So the, I'm what telling you, you so about? there's all kinds of things in a, in a community environment that we, we can help. <laughs> Have you seen this before? Yeah, it's crazy. We, we need to help these people. We do. <laughs> oh, you were pointing at me? Oh. Serious. No, you don't, and that's what they do in these videos. They put water. <laughs> On the service groups, um, do you have any ideas or advice for keeping kind of consistency with those groups? Because I, we've been, you know, trying to rack our brains of, oh, what, what kind of ideas do we pitch? Do we pitch something where it's, we're always, you know, going to the same organization to help out? Because that makes it a consistent invitation that we can always say, hey, neighbor, every other Friday we do this. You know, mm -hmm. can you come this week? If not, you can come a couple weeks. Or to do the one-off things that might be a little more personal, like helping mm -hmm. the neighbors with their yard or their house, right. but maybe is a little more um, less consistent with the timing. And um, so it may, like I have a lot of neighbors that I'm sure would pitch in for like, hey, there's a thing, a need in the neighborhood, but right. does that really connect us to our, to our group? Right, you know? it might not drive to new yeah. horizons. Or, you know. Just curious what your yeah. thoughts are. Yeah. I, my, in my mind, this works out as us being descriptive and not prescriptive, and I think I'm using those words correctly, in the sense of us trying to paint a picture of what we hope this looks like, and then saying, in your groups, um, talk about what your passions are, talk about what your availability is, talk about what you guys think might engage your friends or your neighborhoods or your community, and so... I wanna, this doesn't provide a good answer for your question, but I wanna try to not say, this is how it should look, and then have another group say, oh, but that doesn't work really well for our group, and we want it to look another way. And so I think the, the descriptive part I can give is, let's do food, let's have a service project, and if for your group it works better to say, we're going to partner with a local ministry and have that type of consistency and predictability. If you feel like that's what helps you draw other people in and it works, then I would say follow that and do that. If your group would say, hey, why don't we all just take turns in choosing something based on the what we know our needs in our neighborhoods or community, then I would say do that. So that doesn't answer your question well, but it does paint a picture of we're trying not to kind of say, this is what it should look like, and more say, we want to give autonomy to your group to discuss that. It doesn't really make your job easier in the moment, but I think it will create unity in pursuing something because your group has ownership of saying, this is what we think we want to do. What I really liked about what you said was that you're thinking, you're trying to come up with ideas, right? And it's that kind of a buy-in that we need from, from everyone. You know, a lot of times it's just hard to know as a group what to go do because it's like, well, you know, half of it's just trying to figure out what the needs are, right? And then, and then you know, if you can't find something, you just kind of, nothing ever comes together. So I think the other thing is good idea people <laughs> like you, as well as um, just, you know, centrally the eldership and the staff being that clearinghouse of the ideas that come in so that we can help inspire, you know, groups and yeah maybe it'll be a mix of something regular as well as something more opportunistic but I do think groups will find their rhythm in the sense of trying something and then the groups say that didn't work or we didn't like this because of whatever so let's try something else and it might take us a few months to kind of find those rhythms and then the group will settle into something that I feel like fits your needs let's do this let's take one more question and then at least to those who have kids we want to make sure um, and you can go grab your kids and bring them back in here, but um, just to be aware of our volunteers who are putting in some extra time this evening. So 
for one more question. Um, thinking about all of these different changes and, and what life might look like in the new building, uh, midweek programming, groups doing service projects on some sort of cadence, uh, leadership teams, Sunday morning volunteers. Has there uh, been much chatter about, um, I don't know, updates to administrative processes for like, or directories for keeping track of all of this stuff, uh, communicating all of this stuff that's going on for like, just keeping up with who's doing what, what sort of opportunities are out there, if anybody's moving between groups or just looking for ways to get plugged in or coming up with a new idea, but that idea is already going on or already on the schedule, just mm -hmm. any of, of that. Terry's on top of it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Nicole, yes, and Nicole. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. to the very first question, which is, you know, the, there are different people with different gifts, right? And some have the gift of operations and administration and others are idea people, right? Um, but we're really at the ideation phase and kind of signposting this thing. So the, yeah, the, the nuts and bolts have come together and we would bring in the right operationally focused folks to help nail down the details. Yeah, and our staff, no, I mean, our staff, for to brag about our staff for a second, the staff have, put in a lot of hours in producing content the last two months, like calling Sari and asking her to meet me on a Friday last minute, and, sh and they're so gracious and they've invested so much time in this, so it feels like we're wrapping up the content production part of this, which is gonna free up the space to say, as we look towards that, start thinking about some of those kinds of things, because those are, those are important things, and if, I mean, we're praying that we would get visitors, and, and that's important to say, go here to see what the community, what the service groups are doing, go here to see how you might be able to jump in and serve. Those are all really important things. Okay, so let's do this. We're gonna um, shut off the live stream. If you have kids, go ahead and make your way back there. Sam and Dave and I will make sure that we're available if people wanna continue any sort of conversation and going to coffee and talking about this kind of stuff is one of my favorite things, strangely enough. So I would love to engage in further conversation. So thanks for your time. Have a wonderful week and we'll hang out for anyone else who wants to chat. <laughs>